Hi everyone, welcome to Diabetes Primetime. On tonight's episode, we're gonna talk about how to handle the things about diabetes that are super frustrating. Our guest is psychologist, Dr. Michael Vallis, and we're gonna be covering common issues that are real challenges for lots of people with type two diabetes. Before we get started though, tell me where you're watching from tonight and what about diabetes is most challenging for you. Hopefully we'll cover a lot of those things on our show tonight. Dr. Vallis, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. Oh, you're very welcome. I think the number one thing we hear from people with type 2 diabetes is that the numbers are really frustrating. So I'd like to start off with a few questions for you about that. So the first one is, what would you say to someone who says, I'm trying to make good decisions, I'm eating better, I'm trying to be active, and yet my numbers are still higher than I want them to be? How do we manage the frustration of feeling like all our hard work just isn't paying off? Yeah, it's actually a really, um, really important question because we tend to look at the numbers as though they are what tell the truth. And, you know, we do this and we're looking to, and this, I mean, imagine working and you sort of, you work twice the number of hours, you expect twice the number of pay, you work half the number of hours, you expect half the number of pay. And so, you know, it, it, it that's really the way that we would approach numbers, but numbers don't work that way with glucose because glucose is not a behavior. And so I find this to be very interesting because what I worry about as a psychologist is how do we support sustained behavior change? So it's not what you do today or even in the next week or even in the next month. It's what you can sustain over the next 30, 40 years. Type 2 diabetes tends to progress. So there can be all kinds of non-behavioral reasons why a person's blood sugar levels might not be where they would predict them to be. So what I hear you saying is, um, what we should be focused on are all the things we're doing. Like I walked three times this week, you know, I really worked hard on, you know, not snacking at night. And that in and of itself needs to be enough because the numbers we may or may not be able to control. And one step further, we should be encouraging people to give themselves credit for their efforts, not their outcomes. Focus in on your efforts because those are what you can control. And then we can examine what are the factors that then determine the final outcomes. So another thing we hear a lot, kind of a similar question, diabetes drives me crazy because I do the exact same thing on a given day, eating the same lunch, for example, and my numbers end up totally different. So what would you recommend to someone who's really frustrated about this? How should, how should they reframe it in their minds? That one is actually really important because it refers to this issue of controllability. To what extent can you control diabetes? And again, you can see where the tension is here because we love to say diabetes is controllable. And we know that, you know, for every, you know, percentage point drop in hemoglobin A1C, there's a 40% reduction in retinopathy and other kind of complication risks. But at the same time, that does not, that you can predict your blood sugar. So there, there was a rock song that was sort of had a lyric that said, you know, hang on loosely, but don't let go. And you know what? That's kind of my answer. It's like we do the best we can and then we just kind of observe the reaction. And I think where I'd like to end with that question is when you observe the reaction, how did that happen? The key here is to not be judgmental. So you don't look at that number like I must have failed. You look at that number like, can I explain it? And sometimes yes, and sometimes no. And this is just true. We, we know this, that, that you could do exactly the same thing every day of the week and test your blood sugars at exactly the same time. They wouldn't be the same. All right, before we get too far along, folks, I wanna to do tonight's trivia question. We are doing a super cool giveaway tonight. It is a meal planning guide for building a healthy dinner. Not only does our wonderful diabetes dietitian, Melinda, give you nine easy dinner ideas, she also helps you put together a meal with whatever you have on hand. And you will get that guide for free if you answer tonight's trivia question, which is, true or false, metformin is a medication commonly prescribed to lower blood sugar levels. Is that true or false? Tell us your best guess in the comments, and regardless of whether you're right or not, you will get that awesome guide to building a healthy dinner. One thing we hear from a lot of people with diabetes is that they are tired of all the things they have to think about in order to be healthy. So counting carbs, getting enough exercise, taking meds. How do we balance being healthy and doing the things we need to do with not letting diabetes kind of take over our lives? It's a really, really important question um, because the problem is, of course, diabetes doesn't go away. So you're sort of left to manage it on a on a continuous basis. So I'd like to talk about really um, 
what is the formula for success? And so there are three sort of hurdles to overcome. Diabetes is a burden. We know this. If you live with diabetes, you have imposed on your life more things to do and more risks than people who don't have diabetes or other chronic conditions. And so I see sort of a pathway to success that looks like, um, first, what I call disease acceptance. How can you come to terms with your diabetes? Nobody wants to be sick. I've never heard anybody say, oh, I'm so happy I've got diabetes. Um, and so somehow you got to say, look, you know what? I don't like this disease. I don't want this disease, but I have it. So I'm going to do something about it. So this is what we call disease acceptance. And that varies. So I strongly encourage people to think that they're, they're entitled to go through that as many times as they need to, because you may find that you go through episodes where this seems like it's actually not so bad. And then episodes when this seems like it's really difficult. Hurdle number two is what we call treatment acceptance. What's your attitude towards the treatment that's being recommended to you? Do you think you need it? And do you have concerns about it? This is critically important. And then the last hurdle is what I call readiness for self-management. Diabetes is a disease that you manage in your home, in your life. Don't manage it through the clinic visits. There are only the occasional sort of touch points. And so are you ready to manage the behaviors. And what I love about this concept of readiness is that it gives people permission to not be ready. Everybody thinks, oh, I got to be ready. I got to tell the doctor I'll do it. Yes, I, you know, the diabetes team, they're so nice. I, I totally, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. No, it's not so easy. Change is really hard. So that's kind of the journey. But why would you do all that work? And I think this is the key. So this, here's my successful outcome in type 2 diabetes. The person who says, I've never been healthier since I've been sick. See, this is the gold star of diabetes management, where the person has accepted their disease, accepted their treatment. They found a pathway that they're ready to engage in. And importantly, they become committed to those behaviors because it's consistent with their sense of who they are. We call these personal values or intrinsic motivation. And so for instance, it, the, the question is, do you know, do you, do you test your blood sugar now or, or not? Do you, do you have a healthy meal or not? That's a tough choice. What if the question was, what's important enough in your life to test your blood sugars for? What's important enough in your life to choose a healthier path? And of course, now all of a sudden we start to think about, well, diabetes has risks. And so if I were to reduce those risks, I could live a very full, long, healthy life. Hey, I might even be healthier with the diagnosis of diabetes than I was before I was diagnosed. So that's a long answer. And it's like, but I, I hope it sort of framed it up because it's super important for people to realize that they need support when the burden gets high. But as they navigate disease acceptance, treatment acceptance, readiness, and in particularly find those personal values because then diabetes becomes like marriage, like child raising, and like your careers, which is they're super hard, but they are really what makes life meaningful. I love that. And I, I would also direct people to uh, visit the Facebook group, Type 2 Diabetes Plate Method Support. There are lots of people in that group uh, who say, I am healthier now than I was before I was diagnosed with diabetes. So it is very possible. Dr. Vallis, the next question is a tough one. We've heard from so many people with diabetes that deep down, they feel like diabetes is their fault, that this is something they brought on themselves. When someone says that to you, how do you encourage them to reframe it? It's an excellent question. And, and again, it, it's something that we find to be really important. We live in a society that overemphasizes personal control. We talk as though we can just sort of dial up the life that we want. And, and in fact, that is just so not true. And so, you know, first of all, Diabetes type 2 is way more inheritable than diabetes type 1. So blame your genes because the genetic factors are incredibly powerful with type 2 diabetes. Nobody's fault. And the other is that the personal choices that we're making are reflected by our lifestyles. If you live in North America, you live a North American life, which means 
you are in transit for long periods of time sitting, which means that you don't have the time to uh, make meals from home all of the time, that you find yourself in these situations where we are drifting towards the unhealthy behavior. So as a psychologist whose expertise is behavior, what I like to say is that the human brain is doing what it's meant to do, but it's no longer adapted to the environment. The environment is pulling us towards health, unhealthy behaviors. And that's why really disease acceptance, treatment acceptance, readiness is so important because we help people kind of create their own world in which they feel that they're able to control the factors that improve their health to the greatest extent. And it's super important because it, it's a reflection of what we call internalized stigma, right? This idea that somehow you're less than because you did it to yourself. Um, when in fact, you know, I mean, if you think about that choice, that choice would look like this. I know I'm going to get diabetes. <laughs> I totally know that if I do this, I'm totally, but I'm, that's okay. I'm happy to get diabetes. Like that doesn't happen. That's not the reality that's for not, anyone. That's not the reality for anyone. For those of you who are just joining us, we're here with psychologist Dr. Michael Vallis talking about how to manage the things about diabetes that are super frustrating. And we're giving away a super helpful guide to planning healthy dinners that you will get for free if you answer tonight's trivia question, which is, true or false, metformin is a medication commonly prescribed to lower blood sugar levels. Is that true or false? Put your best guess in the comments and you will get those wonderful recipes delivered to your Facebook Messenger inbox. Dr. Vallis, I think many folks watching tonight have dealt with what we call the diabetes police, those friends and family members who think they're offering helpful advice, but in reality come across as very critical and judgmental. How would you recommend that we deal with these folks? Yeah, this one is actually super, super challenging. Um, I, I'd first of all make the comment that we, I think, are beginning to to view diabetes as more than just a personal disease, but also a family illness. And there's some desire to expand the, the scope of diabetes services to provide, uh, first of all, support for family members. Um, because a lot of times the, what's so irritating to the person living with diabetes is actually intended to be helpful by the family member. It's a great point. But they're actually, they're worried about you and they're trying to do their best to help you. So one of the things that might be valuable is, is if we in the, in the professional community can see them as, I call it a ripple effect. You may not be the, the, your family member may not be the person with diabetes, but they are similarly impacted. And so helping them to manage their stress can be actually really, really important. Um, I think though the, the practical issue is, is how humans tend to behave, which is we give advice. And, and we give advice and we tell people what, what either works for us or what we think would work for the other person, both of which are almost always false. And so um, one of the things that we would encourage you to do as a person with diabetes is those in your kind of close care circle, if you could just have a clear conversation with them somewhere between 20 and 30 times, so don't get frustrated until you know, six months have gone by and you've actually had many, many conversations um, in which you could say, if you want to help me, ask me, how can I help you? So right, there's the natural human tendency. I see somebody, I just going to jump in and help them. Somebody drops their purse and you pick it up. Well, what if you say, how could I help you? I mean, it's like, what do you mean? Why don't you just pick up their purse? They dropped their purse. Of course, you can help by picking up the purse. But in fact, when it comes to diabetes, assuming that you know what the person needs, becomes the problem. And so with these people that we're sort of hoping for support from, but finding that it's hit or miss, then, you know, if you could encourage them, if you really want to help me, the best thing you could do is say, I'd like to help you. What can I do? And then be prepared for a response that sounds like, be quiet and leave me alone. <laughs> or like, get me out of here, because if I don't get out of this restaurant right now, I'm going to eat everything in sight. And so it, it, it allows the person with diabetes to direct it. And that's what's essential, right? Because none of us can assume that we know what another person needs or we know what another person thinks in any given situation. And the best way to find out is to ask. But it goes against sort of that. Uh, I see that as kind of plan C, which is why you need to sort of encourage your carers 
to um, you know really think about it and think about it and think about it. It take this is where the behavior change takes twenty to thirty times. So communicate what we need to the people in our lives. Assume that their intentions are good, which most likely they are, and and communicate, hey, this would actually be helpful for me. And for those friends and family members who might be watching, do ask how you can be helpful instead of just assuming. It's so tempting to think, well, we know, but but the truth is that everybody's different. And so what your loved one may need is probably going to be different because we're all unique individuals. Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times I've practiced psychology for 38 years now. Um, I, I can't how regular it is for me to catch myself jumping in and making some kind of suggestion and then having to say, whoops, I'm sorry. Let me, can I take that back and ask that as a question? Honestly, I, I think I must have, I've said that thousands upon thousands of times, just because I'm also a human. And, and in those situations, your natural tendency is to, is to jump in. And what I can tell you as a, as, as a psychologist is that I've, I've found people incredibly forgiving when you actually say, whoops, I did it again. I'm sorry. I, I, I realize I've just sort of made a statement. You know, can I take it back and start over? And I find people you know, endlessly forgiving if you intend, if that desire to help is what comes through. Dr. Pellis, another source of worry for many people with diabetes is an upcoming appointment with their doctor, especially if we feel like it's been a rough few months and maybe things haven't gone the way we wanted. If someone tells you they get anxious when they have an appointment coming up, what might you suggest? Uh, yeah, um, I would probably suggest to you that, that there's less than one in a hundred person who doesn't get anxious before. Um, and I made a comment earlier about taking the judgment out of the numbers. I would repeat that when it comes to care, taking the judgment out. Why are people reluctant to tell the doctor that they didn't take all of the medication, to tell the, the nurse that they didn't test as they said that they were going to test? And it's because they fear to be judged or they don't want to disappoint the provider. And so I very much believe that the relationship between the diabetes care team and the individual is really critical, but it has to be a non-judgmental relationship. And so I, when I do my training with healthcare providers, I say one of our jobs is to make it clear that we give people permission to tell us the truth. Literally, if you're not taking your medication, please tell us. And I would strongly encourage anyone to really um, share with your provider um, the struggles that you're having because providers do know that diabetes is a difficult disease to manage. And I will just echo that. We, we've done so many interviews with doctors who, you know, spend their whole lives, you know, working with people with diabetes, and they know it's difficult. In my mind, I always hear Dr. John Anderson saying, you know, if you haven't been taking the medication, just tell me. You know, I, I see hundreds of patients. I understand. It's hard. You know, don't feel, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help you. So I, I, I do really enjoy hearing that from you because I think that's that's so true and so helpful. Dr. Vallis, this has been such a helpful reframe on so many topics. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us Welcome. tonight. And a huge thank you to everyone watching at home. Thanks for being here with us. Before we go, here's the answer to tonight's trivia question. True or false, metformin is a medication commonly prescribed to lower blood sugar levels. The answer is true. Metformin is probably the most prescribed medication for diabetes and for many people with prediabetes too. If you didn't get to answer the trivia question, but you'd like that guide for building healthy dinners, tell us in the comments what you thought of tonight's show. We would love to hear it. I'll be back with you in a few weeks. Until then, stay safe and take good care. Good night.